All right. Thank you everyone for uh, being here today. My name is Brandon Beatty. I am program manager at um, YouthWorks. Um, my family is from White Earth. I'm Anishinaabe. Uh, and yeah, I just want to tell you a little bit about first, just to start off as an introduction, what YouthWorks is, um, because this panel is is um, full of YouthWorks staff. So it might be good for you to have a background about um, what we do as an organization. So we are located, um, our office is located in Fargo, North Dakota. Um, we also have uh, offices in Bismarck, uh, Minot, Grand Forks, and I think that's it. Yeah, <laughs> um, we have all kinds of programs for youth from ages uh, 13 to 22. Um, those programs range from transitional living programs for youth that are experiencing homelessness or housing instability, um, a place for youth to uh, you know, kind of develop some skills and have a safe place to uh, land while they they work on moving on to their next stage in life. We have that available for youth between 18, the ages of 18 and 21. Uh, we also have a, a program that's just like that, except it focuses on parenting um, for parenting youth as well. Uh, we have a um, street outreach program that's specifically out, uh, out there for youth that are uh, either homeless or at risk of being homeless. Uh, and just getting some basic needs and getting connected to services. Um, as the name implies, we actually go out in the streets and people where they're at. Um, we also go into other organizations like schools and um, other uh, community places that youth hang out and just connect with youth and, and let them know that there's people here um, if you need any services. Um, we also provide a drop-in service, which is kind of like a uh, basic needs uh, program where you can come in and get some food, some hygiene products, things like that. Uh, we have an anti-trafficking program uh, and school suspension program for youth that are suspended from school um, and probably several more that I'm forgetting. Um, our overall mission is to help runaway homeless trafficked and struggling youth in North Dakota um, with the caveat that it's also we do outreach in Moorhead as well. Um, so that's kind of an overview of what we do. We have um, Several employees, uh, we have um, several indigenous employees, and I thought it would be a good uh, opportunity for us to have a conversation about youth and uh, their strengths and their leadership. Um, so before I go any further, I'm gonna introduce the people on the panel. Um, so I'll start off with Cheyenne. She has been at YouthWorks for five years. She's worked in several different programs in YouthWorks. So she has a really good um, understanding of, of the work with youth and both indigenous youth and non-indigenous youth. Um, and I will let her introduce herself a little bit more. Hi, I'm Cheyenne. Um, my family is from Sisseton, Wapaton, Oyate. I grew up just a few miles south of, quite a few miles south of Fargo. And right now I'm the street outreach coordinator at YouthWorks. Um, and then I also have a hand and foot in the native youth circle that we provide monthly for middle school and high schoolers at the Indigenous Association Monthly. And my background, social work, so. And she's a great social worker. All right, um, next we will introduce Sadie. She is actually um, a recent college grad and she was involved in um, quite a few of the Indigenous-led youth uh, activities going on in the college, which I, I'm sure we'll get into a little bit more as we, we have this conversation. But I will let her introduce herself a little bit more. Um, I'm a Gizi go down. So my name is Sadie. My native name is New Birth Woman. I am originally from the Fargo Moorhead area. I am a descendant from White Earth, but I'm enrolled over in Chicago and Chippewa community in Mole Lake, Wisconsin. I currently work in the anti trafficking program at YouthWorks. Um, I've been working with youth specifically out of college for about a little over a year, and it's been really cool to be a part of like the process of helping like youth kind of go and grow into their identity and like find their own voices. Thank you. All right, Matt is one of our most recent um, employees at YouthWorks. Uh, he's just came on recently, and he works in the out of school suspension program. Uh, and he's very excited about working with youth and helping develop uh, youth leaders. So I'll let him introduce himself a little bit more. Yeah, I'm uh, Matt Johnson. I am a part of the Turtle Mountain Band of Ojibwe. 
um, Anishinaabe, as Brandon put it. Um, I am super new to youth works, but what brought me here is uh, I wanted to be more part of my community and the culture that is surrounding it. Um, I have a background in criminal justice and I'm originally from Bismarck. So I'm I'm really excited for this uh, panel um, talking about the strengths and the leadership of youth. Uh, one of the things that I, I'd like to do to start off is just kind of talk about um, not talk about the strengths, talk about maybe some of the barriers and the struggles that he, that we see. Um, just so we can get that on the table, just so we have an understanding of the context in which uh, youth are developing in our area, and and as we go forward and and try to provide leadership opportunities, like what are the barriers that they they may be facing. So Cheyenne, could you just start us off and tell us a little bit about um, the youth that you work with and maybe like from their perspective, what the biggest struggles are or some of the, the barriers that they face are? Yeah, I can. Um, I guess one of the big ones that I've, I've seen is the overrepresentation in the foster care system. So youth coming out of the foster care system that just are automatically puts them as a low support system. So learning some of these life skills, like getting connected with services is really difficult. Um, you know, I've, I've helped a lot of youth connect with the reservations and their tribes as they don't have that support system. I've helped. I'm really grateful for the MHA nation satellite office that we have here. We've, I've helped youth get their children enrolled in their tribes. So that's been a good one. Um, substance abuse and mental health is also um, a big barrier that we see in the community as well. Um, and those are just a few. And then obviously homelessness, but we have awesome organizations out there and different agencies that are helping these youth get through that. What are some additional barriers or things that the youth that you work with are struggling with, um, either Matt or Sadie? I would just say um, the the gold standard all the time in on reservation land and for natives period is underfunding. Um, not enough money for the programs they need. Um, I know there's not enough programs for special ed, um, dis physical disabilities on reservations. Um, so a lot of times it just boils down to having enough money that we can provide these communities to have the right resources and the right um, things to get them from point A to point B. Kind of tie into all those two, a lot of the stuff I see is definitely kind of like a little bit of like the poverty lines and stuff. And also a lot of like mental health and sometimes co-occurring disorders with that, with like substance abuse and exploitation as well are the things I see often with the youth as some barriers. What um what historical or um different things do you think happen in our in our youth um lives that contribute to these and how does it affect kind of how they navigate resources and kind of you know navigate the world in general? I think definitely a huge one that we can think of currently is definitely the boarding schools and kind of the forced um, movement to reservations. Because with that, we did have a lot of social and cultural losses as well as significant changes that happened. And it definitely disrupted all the family, family dynamics that were already kind of set in place for centuries, if not millennia. So it just became like a huge change and it's still kind of causing a huge disruption that still impacts a lot of our youth to this day, because they still experience all those like family dysfunctions and they feel that loss of culture at times. I think one for accessing services too is, um, you know, not having enough professionals or professionals that look like the youth that we work with. Um, you know, when we see now in our community, we have a lot of up and coming indigenous and other different diverse populations coming into play in these social services agencies. So that is like um, like less of a barrier for them to come and access services, I believe so too. It's uh, it's one of those questions that, that comes up like more and more as we uh, go further into the the boarding school issues and um, things like that. Is it's becoming more in the forefront. Um, so I appreciate you guys uh, highlighting that a little bit. 
So I have the next question is talking about um, some of the strengths and some of the the um, protective factors that you see in the Native American community, the Native American youth community. Um, what are what are some of the because um, we could talk about you know a lot of the the barriers and a lot of the difficulties that youth are are facing, but um, what what I'd like to do now is kind of shift to what are some of the strengths and what are some of the the things that maybe surprise you about this generation coming up or some of the the strengths that you see uh, youth exhibiting. Resiliency. I think that youth are wanting to bring forth their parents and their culture in a in a whole another realm. I think that um, young people now are trying to provide information um, in the social media world that we live in now in a more accessible manner for non-native people. Um, I see a lot of leadership in that way, but also activism in that way. Um, <clears throat> yeah <laughs> it's definitely a lot of like passionate and like a lot of like they're no longer i don't want to say that people were ever afraid to use their voice but individuals all the youth i work with are super like um outgoing and they're willing to like discuss like not only just like issues that are occurring within our community but they're also just so proud to be talking about what their culture is and then kind of finding that cultural identity and spirituality for them Yeah, I would second both what you guys said as far as um, cultural and self identity. That's something that's growing within and just having some of the groups in the community and events like such as today opening ceremony at the bridge is a place for them to connect with their culture. And this is happening like we had the remembrance walk just a few a week ago, you know, so it's like things are happening in our community that they can be a part of and learn. So, as we continue that, we just continue to grow our youth. Excellent. Yeah, I think uh, focusing on those strengths. One one thing I forgot to say in the beginning of this um, is we're going to draw from like our, our professional experience, but also like our our own experience. In this, because we grew up as Native youth, um, some more recently than others, um, you know, and so different generations had different maybe uh, perceived barriers or experiences. Um, do you think that there's been a shift in Kind of the the um, ability for native youth to um, access and and promote culture. I would say yes, because like when I first entered into the school system, there wasn't necessarily a lot of like indigenous related um, education. But now you'll get like there's Fargo Indian Ed, and there's also Moorhead Indian Ed. So those are really cool programs that are like either like haven't established or still kind of getting new. And then there's also like a lot of different groups that eventually started coming around and it was just kind of a space for like some of my friends and myself to just kind of go and just talk about not even just like indigenous related things, but it just helped to build a community with us and become closer as friends. Um, and then even in like the college setting, um, there was definitely a lot of like, um, not necessarily even just like education, but there is the ability to like openly talk about some of those more like, um, activist type things like MMIW and line three, those were a lot of big topics in the college setting. I think part of the young people's resilience and strength is speaking the elders. A lot of these young people are speaking the elders' traditions into existence. Um, so, you know, talking about what Sadie was talking about with the water protectors, I think the basis of that sort of leadership stems from our cultural traditions and that's it. And I think that they're trying to be the voice of our elders in 2021. And so you see that sort of activism happening in uh, No Line 3 um, because it's all based on our traditions and our culture. And once again, yeah, kids are just, they're, they're all about our culture and wanting to be strong voiced and opinionated. I think a lot of native youth nowadays are not like um, like Sadie said, I think it was Sadie who talked about, um, they're not afraid to have the conversations about serious issues anymore. I think that me growing up, I didn't, I, I didn't grow up in a culture like that. So 
I see native youth now who are wanting to use their voice in a more powerful way and not be so much keep that to themselves and the information that they have based on their culture. <clears throat> I like that. Um, that's a, a good point. Like if, if we empower youth to, to have those spaces to take on um, leadership roles and, and use their voice, then they'll take them. And we've seen it over and over again. Just a good segue into the, the next question. We talked a little bit about it, um, but I'd like to go specifically, like what are some ways that you guys have seen um, native youth leadership, um, native youth leadership in, um, in our organization as youth works or in the community or, um, you know, nationally, locally, um, what are, what are some examples that you've seen? I can't think of her name specifically, and I feel really terrible that I can't, but she's the 16 or 17 year old from, um, I believe Canada. And she's like leading the way for a lot of the environmental like factors and that's like on a more international level but it's just going to show how strong of a voice you can have as a teenager and that you can be making a lot of like she's making a lot of like educational not only about like the environmental environmental factors but she's tying into like why it's important with like the cultural aspect as well so it's really cool at that huge of a level to see that significant of impacts occurring but then even within our own communities we have individuals who help lead a lot of those different um like the line three, I think most of them are, there's like a lot of youth that do join those and they participate and they just want to help kind of keep continuing like the movements and just making sure that it's a lot more awareness going on in the community as a whole. Um, in our agency, I would say there's, there's different, many different platforms that youth can take on a leadership role. As I'm learning more and more, we have um, a youth advisory board here, which really takes not specifically native youth, but if a native youth were on it, talk about your story, talk about where you come from, how they can impact how we serve clients within our agency. And then also there's just other national boards that is youth advisory based. And so my one of my dreams is to connect youth to get on those boards to make changes and talk about their story, tell about their story, tell where they're coming from, where they've been and how they've achieved that. So um, there's lots of different platforms that we could plug in native youth to in the in nationally and community wise. And, and to build off of what Shan's talking about as an organization, I think one thing that I love most about being here at YouthWorks is that diversity for our staff. I think the diversity for our staff is only going to help us achieve what we need to achieve with our clients. And so I think, you know, the more native people, the more African American people, the more diverse, uh, you know, cultures we have, it's only going to help serve our community in a different way that I don't think is um, available in a lot of different areas. <laughs> I like that. Did just to go a little more like um, in our personal experience. Did you have anyone in your life that you um, that maybe had a similar cultural background or uh, or experience that you really learned a lot from? And what was that like? This wasn't one of our previous questions. I just sprung it on you. Um, I, I can say Dr. Baker, he was my uh, physician in high school. Um, he was a Native American man and I just, he was so soft-spoken and sweet and he had a braid in his hair and it was just unheard of for me being in Bismarck, seeing this uh, extremely professional man uh, come from my culture and, and, and just carry himself in such a respectful and wonderful manner. And honestly, I've tried to um, mimic his professionalness um, as a Native American man in the, you know, the 21st century. So, Dr. Baker, Bismarck, I don't know if he's still practicing, but he's great. <laughs> I think I was very fortunate with, like, my family growing up, for sure. Like, I was, like, my mom, my grandma, like, even aunts, like, they were all really good figures. But when I think more specifically to even outside individuals, I had a friend 
Um, her name is Katie and she was a significant impact on my life because she really showed me how you can combine kind of like the westernized culture with our indigenous culture and just tying in together like how you don't have to just choose one or the other. There's times that it is just sacred practice, but there is times that you can be just kind of like walking the indigenous life and doing it in a way that is like, it was just super powerful just to see how she lived life and how she spoke about things and just kind of like the patience and the calmness, but as well as being like very passionate about anything she talked about. Um, for me, I feel like I was influenced a lot by my family and continue to be influenced by people that I meet today. I feel as as a girl, we meet so much more people and are getting, I'm becoming more connected with my culture and all I want to do is pass that down to the youth that I work with. And so this is a work in progress and I'm influenced every day. So. Thank you. And I, I can say, like, I'm, I guess I'm not on the panel, but um, it, it was, I agree that having that that person that looked like you or came from a similar culture um, kind of opened up doors for me to say, like, maybe I could do that too. Maybe I could um, be in a helping profession. Maybe I can go to college. Maybe I can, um, you know, do those sort of things. And it, it, was, um, it was super helpful for me as well. It, exactly. I should preface this that the way I felt that way about Dr. Baker, Baker was when I was super young, 13, 14 years old, and I was in a predominantly white city. <laughs> You know, so that's exactly what you said, Brandon. As I uh, saw this professional, I thought to myself, oh, wow, like this, this Native American man is, is a doctor. I could do anything kind of thing. So absolutely. Yeah, so how, how are you um, in your practice today, like working with youth, like how are you trying to, um, to be that person for them? Like what, what are some of the things, are, do you do it intentionally or do you do it, just every day, just be yourself? Or what What are some of your, your thoughts about um, practicing as a professional, a Native American professional um, with youth? <clears throat> well, I would say for me, I'm, you know, I have three young daughters, so I wanted them to see their father you yeah. know, really start doing the, you know, cultural identity stuff with them right away you know so um you know kind of why i'm here is to help you know bring that identity into the forefront for my children as they continue to grow and be in school and um yeah <laughs> lost my train of thought but i think i definitely go more into like just being myself but i also know that there's some youth that are more intentional about asking specific things to the indigenous culture and if they're ever like more curious and everything like that, it will help try to either give guidance or um, like say some of the stories that I know for different things for like some of those traditions. Um, I think one really cool thing um, we were gonna try to do, or we did do, I guess, with Native Youth Circle was doing like, even like the fried bread cooking and like the opportunities we allow for growth within like group settings, but even the individual level, like and kids asked to like, or youth asked to smudge, like allowing the opportunity for them to be able to have that in a safe place to access those things. Um, in my professional career with working with Native youth, um, gosh, I don't really know. You know, things just kind of come up in conversation. A lot of people do want to know where I'm from and what my background is, and I'm open about that with sharing with um, who I am and where I come from. You know, um, we use laughter a lot. That's a big one within the Native people is got to laugh at ourselves. We got to laugh at a lot of things. So we kind of connect in that way as a big one. Um, you know, um, just some things that I've gone through, I've shared with you with, and, and we just kind of make that connection right away. It feels like, so, you know, we kind of have just like, okay, you know, so it's, it's a safe place. And, you know, I offer smudging if that is something that they want to do. Um, yeah, that's about it. Thank you guys. I'm throwing some some curveball questions, but it's just kind of as the conversation goes, I'd like to follow it. Um, we have one more prepared question that I'd like to go, but it's kind of a big one. Um, but before I go into this question, um, I'd like the people viewing this right now, if you have any questions or if there's any thoughts you have or comments, um, feel free to throw it in the chat and I will um, 
I will try to answer some of them as we go along. Uh, so that would be great. So here's the big question. Um, we have youth that have some um, barriers in their life. We have youth that those same youth have a lot of strengths as well. Uh, we have uh, youth that have taken leadership roles um, and have kind of stepped up into that position. So what can we do as um, a community, as an organization, as and, and as individuals to encourage um, and develop native youth leaders um, to be the next generation of um, people doing things in our community and in our world? Educate, 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 educate. Uh, I think, you know, Sadie brought up the boarding schools. I had no idea of talking about that. I just started learning about that. Uh, no line three. Um, it is our job in 2021 to make sure people are hearing the right information, especially when it comes to culture. Um, just keeping people educated, especially non native people. I know that, um, you know, cultural awareness in this state is, is sometimes lack lacking from non native people. And I just think the more we can educate them and, in, and, you know, outside of the state, the better, the better off we're going to be as a culture. And that's just not, that's just not native culture. That's all cultures period. <clears throat> I think another one to kind of help and develop some like your like opportunities for leadership, um, just including them in the conversation for sure, kind of bouncing off that idea and just really making sure that, first of all, like just teaching the traditions as it is, but also how we incorporate that into like some of those guidelines and policies we see within different agencies or even at like the tribal level, and then just trying to help them. And also hearing like the voice of being like this stuff isn't necessarily as optimal. Like, why don't we try adjusting it and like allowing them to start like just voicing their concerns or their opinions and just really um allowing room for that. Cause I know sometimes it can get very easy to feel very like small in like settings like that, but just trying to make it as welcoming and open as possible. Um, mine would be encouraged, just continue encouraging native youth and what platform they can be on. Um we had a youth that spoke at um, about a homeless law and did an amazing job. And he probably never thought he could have done that. And he went in there and he rocked it, you know, and we encouraged him. We pushed him to get to that point out of that comfort zone. And then also to always just like remember and let them know what they've gone through is what they're growing through at this point in their lives. And um just like remember what they go through and what they've accomplished and keeping that encouragement going. You're so right, Shay. And sometimes when you're working with, with native youth, um, it, it's hard to encourage them and see that and show them how far they've gotten um, because it can feel really disheartening when you're in the middle of something and not you can't see that uh, that that progress that you've made. And there's a, a kind of a, a glaring hole like, so next year as um, youth works, I definitely want to get a panel together where the, the youth can like probably like a, a wide variety of ages of youth uh, to, to design a panel and to design a topic and, and um, you know, run the panel. I think giving youth the opportunity to, um, to lead in that way is a huge opportunity for them and a way to give them confidence as well. Agreed. I, I think too, um, another thing is like, we want to be the support system to this youth that may don't have it, that maybe don't have one. You know what I mean? So that's like something as an agency that in our organization is be their support group and help them go through what they're going through. There's a question. Can you all see that? Does anyone have any thoughts about that? Question there, what support does youth works need from the local communities to make the community leaders aware of the services that youth works provides. I think what Matt was saying earlier was a lot of education just needs to be conducted. So I think of how many people just didn't even know about the boarding schools until this past year. 
So there's a lot of support in just helping with aiding in the education and helping pass along like um, valid, like, um, kind of the right word, like valid articles of like the correct information. Um, trying to like think of like how to get it to like community leaders as well though, as like a whole. Because we have a lot of like different agencies like the Native American Commission and Indigenous Association, and we have like Indian education. So I think sometimes it's the collaboration between all of them can be very powerful as well. Absolutely. Agreed, Sadie. Yep. Teamwork is makes the dream work. It makes the dream work. That's what I was about to say. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think um, word of mouth, like as as we go through and we we talk about some of the services, or if you have any questions about the specific services, um, word of mouth is always good. I know. Um, a lot of the youth that we work with, um, if they come in to drop in uh, to get basic needs items, they'll go back out into the community and be like, hey, I just got you know some food from this place, like come by and, and they can you know provide you with that. Um, so word of mouth and like you know, letting people know that we're around, taking a look at the website um, and and just like sending kids that or youth that need things that, that we provide our way um and I, I think that's the biggest one of the biggest uh ways to do it thank you for the question that's a good one here's a question for the panel um when you were younger and you were, um, you know, going through middle school, high school, early college years, um, young adulthood, because we all know that, you know, we're still growing and developing a lot in our early twenties. Uh, what what were some of the things that you felt like you needed from the community, or would would have helped you in your journey in that um, time of your life from the community or from the people around you? I think having a lot of people that looked like me and having a lot of the cultural knowledge as well would have been significant to have because I did have some individuals in the school district, and like especially in the high school years, that um, really were able to impact me in a positive way for the cultural aspect. But I remember like through like middle school and that age range, it was definitely a struggle in the sense of feeling like whitewashed and that loss of identity. And just trying to fit in with my peers and like never i don't want to say i was ever embarrassed of the cultural identity but like as like that age range you're just like this doesn't fit into like the stereotypical identity so it's just trying to help make sure that there's more individuals that can help kind of present as like that positive role model that are really involved and you just kind of follow suit and feel more comfortable with yourself You know, frankly, a state like North Dakota, having so much of a Native American population, it would be amazing if there was multiple multiple mentors for youth in schools um, that are in a predominantly white area, so that they can feel some relation to their culture. Because to agree, you know, to you know, I agree with Sadie and the idea that when I was in middle school, you know, cultural identity was was the last thing I was worried about because of how I how comfortable I felt around my peers. And, um, you know, when you look around and you don't have, um, you know, someone that looks like you or, you know, like I, we talked about, you know, the programs, I didn't, I didn't, <laughs> what was an after school native program, you know, I, that was that that wasn't something. Um, so, um, once again, just having the educational tools in place for people, um, native youth that, you know, get done with middle school and they can go to a program um, that's strictly for natives. Um, so that they can find a little cultural identity, but um, that's the hardest part when you're that age, trying to find that cultural identity when you don't see it around you. Um, definitely experience that for sure. I agree with Matt, um, just cultivating that self identity at an early age. So when you get older, you know who you are and are strong and who you are. I think it's really cool around this area for sure. Like kind of tie back into like powwows and stuff and like how there's two that happen in the Barbara Moorhead area 
and sometimes there are additional ones that happen with different, like today, the one that's going on at Warren High School for Indigenous Peoples Day. And there's just a lot of opportunities in that sense as well. And it's been really cool to see those slowly kind of grow and grow more over the years. Absolutely. I think we can all agree. I think um, we've all had different backgrounds and different like levels of being in, in touch with our culture and being comfortable with our culture. Probably it probably happens at different times in our lives where it, it's, uh, you know, maybe more in touch and less in touch with our culture and our, our identity like that. Um, but it seems like it's a pretty universal thing. Um, and I, I would agree as well, like when growing up, we, I, you know, I grew up in the Twin Cities area and there was quite a few Native Americans, but um, it was never really like um, in middle school or high school, it wasn't anything big to be like excited about in my mind when I was growing up. It was just more like, yeah, that's you know, kind of part of who I am, but it doesn't really matter much. So giving the opportunities to showcase and highlight that is huge. What do you think um, is uh, the best way to, um, to in different settings, like you can think of different settings, like in school, at home, in the community, um, what are the best ways to help encourage native, like native youth to take leadership roles? One of the case studies I was reading about some indigenous youth in, I believe it was again Canada, I don't think it was the United States, but something that they did that was really neat was kind of allowing a platform for just teaching about wellness and stuff because we often talk about like mental health and spiritual well being, but we sometimes don't always talk about the physical wellness because we need kind of like an overshot. But it was definitely like teaching about like how diabetes is one of the things that can be thought as like a historical barrier that wasn't really prevalent until um, later. Um, but it's just teaching about like different platforms like that and kind of getting more initiatives for opportunities. Um, and that's different things that we as an agency can just even do like at a really, really small level too. It doesn't ever have to be significant, like a whole community or statewide level. It's so just kind of offering things like that. Yeah, like Cheyenne mentioned, having youth be a part of the conversations, the serious ones, the ones that uh, involve policy changing of, um, you know, different things, um, you know, they want their voices heard. And I think that's um, where you start is make sure the voices are heard and let them be a part of, you know, that process. Yeah, just continue to listen so that they know they're being heard. Always treat them like they're the up and coming elders for sure. All right. Well, I think um, I'd like to leave it open for um, maybe a couple more questions here with also a uh, just a kind of a, a summary of, of some of the things that we're talking about. And I think one of the, the biggest pieces through this conversation, and that's what these panels truly are, is just a conversation about things that are important in a way that um, hopefully will do something. And, and what I hope that this does is remind us as maybe if we're professionals or adults in the community, uh, you know, working with Native American youth, kind of taking away some of this, like letting that letting youth ask questions, letting youth take leadership roles, letting youth make decisions, letting youth, uh, you know, not necessarily letting, but having youth be a part of those conversations is a way to help develop the leadership of the next generation. So can I ask a question, Brandon? Yeah. Great, this is Dan. I'm curious, how important are land acknowledgements um, to the growth and development of youth? I mean, we're seeing them more and more, and really, I think they're they're fantastic. Um, they seem to. And I'm I'm just curious for your perspective.
I can start off. Um, I was just waiting to see uh, if they had anything to say first. Um, I, I think it's a relatively like new thing that's happening, and I, I really like the idea of like respecting a culture and respecting the past in a way by acknowledging that this was like tech. Uh, like just to give maybe if not everyone has an idea it usually acknowledges who was on the land before um you know europeans came into the this country and just respecting that and honoring that that um this was indigenous land um and you see different iterations of that throughout um different institutions and they're usually very very carefully crafted um they're very much um taken like in consultation with you know, elders and people of the community to just make sure that they're being very respectful of how they they acknowledge that. Um, and so I, I'm, I would be making things up if I could, if I tr would tell you how I think youth uh, uh, respond to that. But I, I think, because um, I, I haven't really asked that question before. It's a good question to ask. How about you guys? Do you have any um, ideas? Have you ever been uh, heard? Have you ever heard a land acknowledgement with a youth and never asked about kind of what they thought of that or if they had any questions about it or what their response was? Well, only thing I can really equivalent it to is like the land back movement that's happening, especially significantly in like South Dakota. And a lot of the youth that um, I had worked with actually were part of like a small march that raised awareness for the land back movement. And they were very, very passionate about um, the United States and different states, not only recognizing and acknowledging some of those like land things, but also respecting some of the treaties for sure. Yeah, I think Dapple and No Lime 3 is, is based around exactly that. Um, you have young people who see where the history is that lies in treaties. The US government signed those treaties they gave us these pieces of land and now in this day and age you want you have oil companies that want to put piping you know lines through these places that have been given to us by law so i think you have a lot of young people who are seeing the criminal justice side of this not only just the environmental side but there's a criminal law situation when it comes to treaties that we've been you know given and this this land that's on these treaties it was not supposed to be taken from us because there was already all this other land that was taken and this was our reward um so i think a lot of young people are seeing that now and that's why you see this activism environmental activism on places such as no line three and dapple and it, it I, I really enjoy the fact that youth are, are learning more about treaty rights and like uh treaties and how they were made and and where they came from and how they uh they uh ended up because I know on white earth, like they signed a treaty to make the reservation. Um, and within that year, the treaty was broken. They, they didn't follow the US government didn't follow through with their side of the treaty, um, which included like housing on the reservation. And so like, you could see how there's like that distrust, but there's also like a historical, uh, reason for that. And then also like a call to action today by the youth, um, to go out and try to. Um, assert some of those rights in different ways and try to, um, you know, make the the things better that, you know, they see as not being so good. Yeah, I, you know, it's interesting. The, the question kind of came from an experience from when I was a kid in South Fargo and I had a friend who would go back and forth from Turtle Mountain. And it was almost like when I think back, like he didn't have roots, which doesn't make any sense, you know? And so, um, yeah, I, I can't help but feel like, you know, I mean, they, yeah, with these acknowledgements that if nothing else, it kind of like recognizes the colonization a little bit and then empowers, I think, you know, Matt, Matthew is saying, you know, like, you know, his position, you know, he had somebody that looked like, you know what I mean? You know what I mean? So it gives you that, that, that strength maybe to, if you're the only one to say, you know what, um, I'm here, I matter. I have a voice. I've, our roots are deeper. They were taken. You just gotta, just gotta. It's down there. We gotta find it, you know. And and maybe like those of us in in other from in other as part of other cultures could could do do more to support that. Because it's all common truths, 
you know, we're all bound by the human experience, you know, uh, this spiritual, this idea that we're not humans in a spiritual body, but spiritual beings living a human existence sort of thing, right? So I'll, I'll end my spaz attack with there. <laughs> Thank you. It's a good point. Uh, Charlie, did you have something? I saw you pop onto the screen, not to call you out or anything, but <laughs> if you do, um, I'd like to open it up as well. If you guys have something you want to ask, sometimes it's easier to ask verbally um, than, you know, writing something. So, does anyone have any questions, comments? Well, I just want to say that I think the work that you do with young people is phenomenally important, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and stay tuned for um, hopefully next year. Like during this year, I think part of our our prep time um, at YouthWorks will be developing um, a youth panel to be able to come in and and ask um, or talk talk about a subject that they choose. And as they do that, um, you know, kind of answer some questions from their perspective and and do a presentation like this. Um, I think that would be great. I think uh, being able to ask youth the questions, um, we're able to ask youth questions every day, um, which is a, one of the greatest parts of our job is because you never know uh, where they're going to come from on certain uh, ideas or, or certain topics. And um, every day is a new day when you ask a teenager a question about something. Um, those of you with teenagers know that. Um, but also people who work with youth know that. Uh, so I, I really hope to get that energy in a panel next year as well. All right. Well, I think there are no further questions. We're going to end like 10 minutes early. Um, thank you very much for listening. Uh, if you have any questions about um, either Native youth circle which is a program that runs once a month for native youth in middle school or high school uh that just does cultural activities so if you have if you know a native american youth that would be interested in that uh be sure to call youth works and ask for either brandon cheyenne sadie casey who's not here on the the panel or um uh, matt and we'd be able to help you out um we also have an email flyer list so you can get at, you can call and ask to get on that list um, yeah, if any, and if you, there are any resources that we talked about today, um, that, you know, that any youth could use, uh, be sure to call YouthWorks and, and talk to Nancy. She's our receptionist here in Fargo, and she will direct you in the right direction.